Good morning to you. That will be a joyous day, but today's a good day to be here to worship together. We thank God for that privilege. A lot more kids here this morning than I thought there'd be, being <coughs> spring break. We do have several that seems to be out, but we have visitors. I want to thank our visitors for being here. Have some special visitors for me. I invite you to get to know them if you don't already before they before they leave. To our visitors and to those who may be thinking about becoming a part of this congregation, I'd just like to tell you that this congregation, this group of people, has always been known for their spirit of generosity. Where the need is in uh, India, Africa, Ecuador, Mexico, now in the Philippines. They have always stepped up to the plate. Last Sunday evening, Group 5 packed three large boxes of clothing donations that you have provided. There's quite a lot of clothes in there. What do you think, Ethan and Samuel, maybe 150, 200 pounds easily? I can tell you those women had way too much fun packing those clothes. It was a joy to hear the laughter and them communicating with one another and uh, just standing on the outside listening in. It's a great time. A group of us will be taking them Monday to Kentucky to be shipped. They'll make their way from Kentucky to Chicago, then from Chicago to LA, and then be put on a container ship. It's my understanding that it'll take one to two months for them to ever reach the Philippines. That's why we need to get the pipeline going, and this will be the first one in the pipeline. If you'd like to place your marker at the book of Acts and Paul's letter uh, to the Philippians, we're going to get over there in just a few minutes. As has been announced, if God permits, Alan and I will be leaving for the Philippines the 9th of next month. We hope to return, uh, no, the day of the, uh, the 9th. We will hope to return on the night of the 23rd. Since Alan is away preaching elsewhere today, I just wanted to take this time to talk with you about why we elders feel that it's important for us to make this trip. And I want to do that by using Paul's letter to the church at Philippi as a backdrop and for content. But first, what I want you I want you to meet some of our brothers and sisters in Christ that we are going to be visiting while there. As Charlie McLaughlin is fond of saying, put some skin on people who we've only heard about or read about. Actually get to know them. Wrong one. Haven't used PowerPoint in years. So. <clears throat> The Philippine Islands lie about 9,000 miles from Athens, Alabama. They're out in the South Pacific Ocean just as you start to cross into the uh, South China Sea. That's right, isn't it, Cork? Cork has spent a lot of time there uh, in his Navy days. On the island depicted in green, you can see Manila down at the south, uh, south end of the island. That's where Alan and I will be flying into. Then we'll take a shuttle up to the uh, blue dot on the north end of the island. That's the towns of Tukukara and Solana, and they're in the Kegion Valley. That's marked, as I said, with the blue uh, plus sign there. I practice those names all week and I still can't say them. And I'm going to mess the ones up uh, on into the lesson as well. You've heard us speak about Robert Pater. 
I want you to meet Robert and his family. That's Robert on the left. Robert is 51 years old. His lovely wife, Tess. His eldest son, Jeremy, who's 27. Jericho, who is 25. Jerome, who is 23. Joyce is 19. Rolando is 13. They're all baptized believers. I don't know what happened with uh, Rolando. I guess they ran out of J names. <laughs> Robert preaches for the Banga Church in Solana. Robert also has a brother uh, who preaches. His name is Jimiana. Main Street has supported Robert for many years, longer than I've been a member here. To date, no one from Marion Street has ever been to visit with him. Jeremy works a night job so that leaves his day free uh, to preach for the Bond Church in Solana, and he participates in the evangelizing trips that they take. Jerome and Jericho, they're also active uh, in the local church. This is the matter, Maddie, uh, Manny Pater family. Manny is Robert's uh, nephew. Manny uh, preached for the Bagnot and Banga church uh, in that local area. I don't know his uh, wife's name yet, nor his children. I hope to meet them and get to know them. This is Robert's brother-in-law. Tess's brother, Rosalino Esperanza. Rosalino preaches for the St. Louis Church and the Stowe Thomas Church uh, out in the countryside. The next family you meet will be the Bonnie uh, Morales family. Bonnie is a faithful preacher and he assists uh, Robert in preaching in the Benga Church there in Solana. Now these men along with several other men. They're doing their best to evangelize this area of the Philippines. They will come together, team up, and they tirelessly work every week visiting as many churches and as con conducting as many house-to-house -house Bible studies as they possibly can. They appear to have their best success out in the countryside. They sometimes drive for an hour or more. They park and then they walk for up to an hour to reach the people, oftentimes in the rain as depicted by the slide up in the right hand corner. Sometimes they ride motorcycles as far as they can. Here are some of the places that they go to evangelize. When uh, you get out of the cities, into the countryside, they're real low on the economic scale. It's easy to me to understand why Robert uh, has a passion to evangelize with these people because I was talking with Robert oh, the other week or so ago uh, by message, of course, and I asked him how he came to understand and believe the gospel. He said, well, when Tess and I first got married, we were invited by my brother to attend worship with him to a little congregation of about 10 or 15 people. He said it was out in the countryside, and after about five or six months, they came to understand the gospel, and they were baptized into Christ. They had to walk an hour to worship to a church where there was no bicycle trails, no motorcycle trails, they only had foot trails. After having two children, they carried those children on their back for an hour of walking to worship. So I can see why he has a passion for those people. That's the introduction to some of the people that I have gotten to know by social media and talking with them. And we will be 
talking with very uh, a, a lot more while we're there, I'm sure. Now what I want us to do, I said I'd like to use Philippians as a backdrop and for context. I want us to consider Paul's letter to the Philippians. This letter contains just a lot of doctrinal points. And we can explore those maybe some other time, but today I want us to consider it from the very personal nature that it is. But first I want to uh, thank Steve Mosley for inspiring me or sparking my interest in going back and studying, doing a personal study on the book of Philippians. This came from his class he taught a few months ago. Steve, I hadn't really realized just how personal and how, what a strong bond and mutual affection Paul shared with this church until going back and looking at it. Usually, when you, if you're a first century church and you receive the letter from Paul, he was dealing with some point of contention, some problem. If you remember, you might say, oh no, what have we done now? But that doesn't seem to be the case with Philippians. When we read through this letter that Paul wrote, there's no mention of disturbance because of, because of a persecution or failure of doctrine or even in their personal life. Yeah, a, a couple of ladies had gotten sideways with each other, but that seems to be minor. And he just hit it and went on. To understand Paul's relationship with this congregation, I think we have to go back to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Luke relates in a, chapter 16 a story that he found a young man in Derby and Lystra named Timothy. And he decides to have Timothy travel with him. They make their way down to Troas evidently trying to go into Asia, but the Holy Spirit uh, prevented them from going, and it's there Paul received what we have come to know, the Macedonian call. Guided by the Holy Spirit, they came to Philippi, where Paul finds a gathering of Jews on the riverside. Paul begins to teach them. Uh, there was a lady there by the name of Lydia in verse 14, uh, 14 tells us a woman named Lydia was listening. She was a seller of purple fabrics from the city of Thyatira and a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the thing Paul spoken by Paul. You know, we don't even know if Lydia was Jewish. Luke just says she's a worshiper of God. Like, she, like he said about Cornelius. I've read that the name Lydia is of Greek origin. She may have just been there trying to sell her purple cloth to the Jews. It says she was listening. That sounds to me like she may have been kind of standing on the outside looking in and listening in on the service of the Jews. Don't know. Jew or Greek, it didn't matter. Upon receiving the gospel, her joy and her gratitude of generosity was displayed immediately. Verse 15 says, Now when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. The next convert that Luke lets us see is a Philippian jailer. And he almost certainly was a Roman. The same joy and the same spirit of generosity also was exhibited by him. Because in verse 33 and 34, And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized. He and all his household, and he brought them into this house and set food before them, and was overjoyed since he had become a believer in God together with his whole household. The church at Philippi, as this congregation here is, was characterized by a spirit of generosity. And even after Paul left, that spirit continued. 
In chapter 4 of Philippians, Paul says, you Philippians know that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even the Thess in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. The Philippians even sent a gifts to him, Paul, when he was in Rome by Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I have an ample supply, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Now, Scripture places Paul at least three times at the city of Philippi. The last time was when he was coming back with a collection of the saints to Jerusalem to uh, d distribute to the needy in, in Judea. Timothy and Paul soon left uh, Macedonia when he was there, and he left Timothy and uh, Luke there, looked like to build up the infant, con uh, infant congregation that had started. Timothy soon followed Paul. But he was sent back by Paul to Macedonia, probably uh, to uh, Philippi. And from the we sections that we see in Luke, it seems that Luke stayed there the entire time that Paul and Timothy were gone. So I'm asking you, what's the occasion for Paul to write this letter? Over the years, their deep affection for each other had flourished. It didn't matter about their background, skin color, nationality. That bond was built and was affection just flourished as long as he was there and, and coming through and, and communicating with them. I think what Paul is saying in verses 3 through 7 of chapter 1 that Glenn read to us, I know you love me. Because even in my chains, you had fellowship with me. And in my defense of the gospel, you are partakers of this grace with me. So, I remember you in my prayers. If you read this letter, I think with a passion and emotion, which I feel it was written, I'm going to suggest to you it's a stunning revelation on what true love is all about. One writer poetically writes, Joy, happiness, and true love radiates through this letter like sunshine spreading over a grassy knoll. I'm calling it, as you can see on the screen, Philippians, a love letter from Paul. Think with me for just a moment. If you were writing to those you love, in uncertain circumstances and knowing very well it could be the last letter that you write to them. Just what words would you choose to express your love for? I dare say you'd choose your words very carefully. Why is that? Because words mean something. I once saw D. Bowman years and years ago. He didn't have a PowerPoint. He had a green board, and he drew it on the green board as he, as he talked about it. D is Russ's brother, for those who didn't get to know him while he was still alive. It's a very elementary point, but I think it's effective. The point he was making, when you start to write something, or when you are thinking of writing someone, you start with a thought. And then you start thinking about what words you want to add to that thought. And you add words to that thought. And then you think a little more. You add other words to that thought. You keep going. You have more words that you're going to add. Another word. Maybe you add two more words here. Then you add another word. What do you have? When you string enough words together, you have a train of thought. That was Dee's point. And Dee, if you didn't know him, 
you would have to say he was a wordsmith because he had a vocabulary that astounded you. I, I, you can't keep, you couldn't keep up with it. Words mean something, as we said. The word slave. If you were writing to your loved ones, as we talked about, would you start off your letter by telling them, "I'm now a slave." Chapter one, verse one. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. If you start off that word "slave," slave denotes work. And by slave, Paul means someone has bought me. I no longer have a will of my own. I can only do the will and work that, of the master who has bought me. He told the Romans in his, the letter to Rome, do you, know not, do you not know that when you continually offer yourself to someone to do his will, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey, even slaves of sin, which leads to death? or obedience, which leads to righteousness. Paul chose to tell his loved ones, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Now what I want us to do is look at some of the words that Paul uses in his letter repeatedly. You know, if the Holy Spirit repeats the same word, pay attention, because he's placing emphasis on that. If you were writing your letter. Would you unashamedly use the name of your master 43 times in a short letter? Paul did. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that will full, with full courage now always now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If the gospel has reached you and has caused you to rejoice, would you use the word joy 17 times in your letter? Keep on rejoicing in the Lord at all times. I will say it again. Keep on rejoicing. Let your gracious attitude be known to all people. Never worry about anything. Instead, in every situation, let your petitions be made known to God through prayers and requests with thanksgiving. You know, Paul asked them to be at peace with one another. And twice he tells them, to be of the same mind. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul uses he uses the example of Christ as how to achieve that oneness. Have the same mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, counted not being on the equal with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, trying, taking on the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, being humble himself, becoming obedient even unto death, Yea, the death of cross, death of the cross. Paul wanted them to know that his master is coming back. So he gave three times, four if you count the resurrection that he mentions, the day of Christ. And it is my prayer. That, you love, that your love will keep on growing more and more with full knowledge and insight so that you may be able to choose what is best and pure and blameless until the day of Christ when He returns, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus so that God will be glorified and praised. 
Why did he want them to know they're coming back? Paul tells them. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. What kind of train of thought do you think Paul's trying to get his loved ones to see? You think it might go like this? Because I love you, I want you to know the most important thing you can do in life is to give yourself to Christ Jesus. Have no will of your own. Let His will become your will. Let His gospel be the guiding principle in how you live your life and rejoice in it until Christ returns. Yes, I do believe that Philippians is Paul's love letter to the saints at Philippi. Paul loved these brethren so much that he wanted them to thrive spiritually. It's obvious that above any concerns for their health, for their jobs, for their safety, he most of all wanted them to remain faithful to Christ. Shouldn't that be our goal as well for those that we love? In every report that Robert sends, he expresses his deep gratitude and his continual prayer for the Marion Street Church. And his thanks to us for being a part of his work that allows him to continue that work. Paul said, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. It's time that we go to greet the saints in the Philippines and to take your greetings with us. We want to show them we're not just sending dollars. We love them. We're seeking the same relationship with them as Paul had with the saints at Philippi. We want them to know that through his reports that we receive just as much encouragement from him, if not more, than he receives from us. The point is, we're all one in Christ. In closing, let me just borrow the words, if you would, of Paul. I'd like to use them if they were my words to you here at Marion Street and also to the faints, saints in Philippi. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, whatever things are pure, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue in any of these things, any praiseworthy, meditate on them. I don't want you to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. May I say to you, if you want to have that peace in this life, the peace that surpasses all understanding, the only way you're ever going to achieve that is to first have peace with God. Isn't that what we all desire? Isn't that what we all want for our loved ones? The only way that we can have that peace is to become a slave of Jesus Christ. And we can do that today. If you desire that peace, if you'd like to be 
have the same comfort that Paul and the disciples at Philippi had, let it be known as we sing the invitation song. <laughs>